Hello again, everyone. I'm so happy to see everybody here. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Zoe Garber, a sophomore here at High Point University. Um, I decided to plan this event because, um, not just because my family is Jewish and I would like to raise awareness for a topic like this, but because of my passion to never forget the events that happened during the Holocaust, honor those who we have lost, and to listen to the courageous survivors such as Mr. Brote. Um, I just find it really important that we never forget what happened and that we take this time to listen to the survivors. So if you would please join me in welcoming Mr. Brote. He's right here to speak with us tonight. First of all, I want to thank the university for inviting me and the beautiful crow, Zoe, who made contact with me. What a blind date, I tell you guys. <laughs> Before, I would like to take the liberty and to thank the people who made possible for me to be here and share the experience I had after I was liberated. And I'm talking about our veterans. Compassion in God source of mercy, we pay tribute to those who served our country to express our gratitude for the courage and selfishness for both among us today and those generations past. The nation built those born on this soil and those who have come from here, from corners of the earth, and continued journey towards destiny. May we never let down those who served in defense of this country. May we uphold the values of freedom and the inherited dignity of every human being. By our own, own right conduct and by the kindness of tolerance we show to one another. May we lead the world by example and become the words of Isaiah, a light to the nation. Then, with the labors and sacrifice of these veterans, be honored, not in words alone, but in our deeds. Thank you. As you know, I was born in Poland, and I finished school, the elementary school, in 1939. Little did I know that England and France had agreement with Poland in case we be attacked by the Germans, they will come to our help. Sure enough, they held up to the contract. And when we were attacked, they came to our help and they declared on Germany war. They didn't last too long before the Germans marched in to our town, town called Borislav which is located right here. This is where I was born. Next town, approximately 11 kilometers, was a school which I attended. Before we know it, didn't take too long. I went, so happened, it was a holiday, day of atonement. I went to the temple to say the prayer in the evening, and there were a lot of military vehicles. Germans, Russian, all kinds. But we went to eat, look, just looked at each other and went to the say our prayers. After the prayers were over, we walked out, which was evening, not a vehicle to be seen. We were all surprised, what has happened? Little did we know that Hitler and Stalin had an agreement. Once the war starts, he will occupy Poland, but the other half of the Poland the Southeast Poland will go back to Russia, known as Ukraine. He will give this back to Stalin, providing he won't interfere. He held to it. They walked out. The Russian walked in. As soon as, as, soon as they walked in, they put speakers on a telephone poles, and the music was playing all day and all night with propaganda and 
music. I was alone. My brother and sister were married. They left house, and I was left with my mother. And I needed a job. Well, it didn't take too long. I found a job. I was changing Latin letters to Russian letters and the typewriters. They paid little, but it was enough to get by, especially when you have just two people and mother that knows how to scheme, how to say we were able to survive. But then I committed a crime under the Russian rule. No, I didn't steal. I came to work half an hour later. I had to go to court, and my punishment was 10% out of my salary for two months. The salary wasn't big enough to live on, however, it was even less when they deducted the 10%. Mother was learned to learn how to cook, deal with it, and we were able to go by. Didn't take too long, time flies back when you're young. And before you know it, it was 1941, June the 22nd, Sunday morning, the radio gets loose and comes a his Moscow. We were told at four o'clock in the morning that Kiev was bombed and the Russian declared the war on the Germany declared war on Russians. Didn't take them too long, they marched in. The Germans marched in, after all they were there before. Soon they became a ruling. The German government requested from the Jewish population to find certain people who will go between, between Germans and the Jewish population. The order came out that every male or female has to put a star of David on their arm. And every more evening, they will put a request to supply people to do some work. I was young, I was only 13 years old. I didn't have to go to work, but this doesn't mean that I didn't want to eat. So in order for me to eat, I had to go to an assembly place, and there were some people who were better off than I, and they were willing to pay me five slaughter and a piece of bread, providing go to work in his name only. And I was able to find out of five days, I was able to find two days work, three days, some nothing. So I did the best I could to find the work so my mother and I, we could survive. We lived like there for quite some time. Didn't take too long. The Russians were overrun by the German army. They were there before, and they came back. We had Polish, German, and Ukrainian working with us. It was approximately 50,000 people inhabited. We were very industrial. We had the oil. And the harbors where I went to town, they had the refineries. So we were getting along pretty good as far as unemployment is concerned. But then what happened, the Ukrainians from the little towns went to the German government and requested a free hand. I don't think so whether the Germans were that bad but it was to understand what they were talking about. But nevertheless, they were given the free hand. They came to town following morning with scythes and sickles and killed close to 175 people on the street. The Germans put the stop to it. They didn't expect what has happened at that particular time. And the German government ordered the Jewish committee to supply men to clean up the corpses from the streets. However, my thoughts, at least they got a decent burial that were burned in a Jewish cemetery where nobody knows what has happened afterwards. The population, Jewish population, was getting smaller to no aware whoever lost brother, sister, father, mother, what has happened to them. There was no information given to us, where did they go? As the population was getting smaller, the order came that every Jew living in a certain area 
has to move to a specific area designated by the German government. As the population was getting smaller, so was the places where to stay was getting smaller too. Some people had family that are willing to share with the other people. Some people just stayed forest, whatever they could find. Food, there was no food. Then a disease broke out, typhus fever. The pharmacies were close to us. Doctors were not available. Hospital was too filled. Nobody was there. We lived there, and people were dying of flies. Finally, the center was getting smaller, either by debts or by taking it out. Then the German government got in touch with the Jewish committee requesting a list of people who are sick and cannot support themselves, who haven't got enough play money to live on, hasn't got work, and or cannot find the work. They didn't care. The list was given, and this was 1942, September the 3rd. I was home with my mother, and I heard a knock on the door around 4 o'clock in the morning. I got open the door, and there's a German police, Ukrainian police, and Polish police, and my mother and I, we were on that list. They took us away from home, and they marched us to the railroad station, which is approximately two kilometers. However, my mother was greatly ill from hunger. She's a bedridden. She couldn't walk those two kilometers. In the middle the way, they stopped the truck, who picked up some Jews from a different places and driven to the railroad. My mother was put on the truck. I walked the rest of the way to the railroad station. The railroad station was full of people sit, laying on the floor, sitting on the floor. There were railroad cars lined up, cattle cars, waiting for us. When do we going, go into those cars? I couldn't find my mother anymore in that railroad station. Either she passed away while going there, or she was too sick to be seen. Around 1 o'clock, there came three German men, civilian clothes, and some Gestapo men. And this was a segregation. Everybody had to go in front of them. Either you by twist of his arm, either he went to the left or he went to the right. If he went to the left, he was spared. He thought that the man is strong enough to do some work. I was sent to the right and I was going to the railroad Kettle, cattle, and somebody taps me on his shoulder. There was a tight turn. There was a German officer, and he asked me, How old are you? Well, I added a couple of years to my age, and he sent me, You're strong enough to go to work. I stayed there, and around 3 o'clock, we were dismissed. People walking hazily didn't know whether to go to home, didn't know they were taking away, whether to find somebody. Maybe he ran away. To forest, came back to see where somebody's alive. What somebody was. This was going on for two and a half days. Between Borisov and Drohovich, which happened the same thing in Drohovich, they lost approximately 3,000 people, was disappeared in thin air. You think, well, you got neighbors that will try to help you, like heck, they did. The only thing to help you, go to you and tell you, if you have some valuables or some money, we can buy them out from that camp. People gave the last penny what they had, hoping that the person will be released to reunite it. The only thing they part in addition to the family is the money. You didn't see anybody, everything disappeared in thin air. The thing was getting smaller, then it came the fourth action, and there, at the outskirts of Borisov, there were German army barracks. They had went to the front or home, and we were sent from that ghetto, was for by that time, to that camp. There were two wings, one for ladies and one for men. We had to stay there. It was a community kitchen. And every morning, we were assembled and go to work, counted by the Ukrainian or Lithuanian guards, how many people went out, 
And when they came back, they were counted again. As long as the towel fit, everything was okay. They had a little some money, and they could go out if the guard was nice enough to let them go to buy additional ration. They did, and they came to, to that camp. There were some young people who tried to take something of unbelievable. They say, let's form about 20 guys, 18, 20 years old. Let's go from that camp east through the forest to the eastern front, to the Russian. Maybe we will get there. And they made a pledge. If we go through that forest and we come upon a civilian man, he has to be taken care of. Meaning mean by taken care of? That he never gets from the forest to the home. But people are people, no matter how much. They let one guy go. And sure enough, that guy went to the police. Out of the 20, only one man survived and came to camp and tell the story what has happened. The life was going on, but there was one man, a young man, Leon Ettinger. He said, had little money, and he contacted the forester to hide his mother, and he will pay him the money, which he did. But money is not a well. Money runs out, too. The money ran out, and the forester's wife went to the Ukrainian police and told him, there's a Jewish family living in our house. The police came, took the woman, and the woman was shot. However, her son didn't want to give up early. Eye for an eye, cheek for a cheek. He got a gun, went to the forest, and killed the man. His wife knew him. He knew who he was. She came every morning as we were going to work, tried to find the man who killed her husband. She was going about four or six weeks, and the man was nice enough, was hiding. Knew what's going to happen. He was safe for about four or six weeks, as long as she was coming. That one day, finally, she came back, and sure enough, she identified him. He was taken into the rebel place, and one of the sidekick of the camp commandant, the Germans, he beat the boy to death. He took his eye out with a wrapped around wire and letter. He beat him until he died. People knew what was going, life was going on. I had a sister. She was married. And she lived on a gentle side, on a Christian side, and working in a hospital. At the same token, I got a job to work as a messenger, going from camp to center of the town, buy additional ration, whoever gave me the money or asked me to get something, or pick up a prescription for them. At the same token, I had to pass to go to the German store and pick some ration for them. So I went to the German store. It was a delicatessen store. And the lady, the teller, recognized me because my sister was a beautician and she did her hair. And out of the blue sky, she tells me, the baby's okay. Three words. I didn't know what it was. Baby, I didn't know she was pregnant or something like this. However, the only thoughts I had, I will come tomorrow, and I will find out who the lady is, where does she live. Maybe I make contact with her. I want to see her. I don't want to take her away. I just want to see her. Mother's intuition. The baby was six months old. She took the baby, put it in a trunk, and left it under Christian orphanage. My next visit, I went there. She told me, the baby is safe. A lady took the baby as her own child, and she's resting there. Two weeks later, the woman, the Polish woman, went to the Ukrainian police and said there's a Jewish woman and her husband live in that hospital. She was taken in 1943 she walked the plank next to the slaughterhouse 
and they were killed, 600 people. And this was the first time the execution took place in their hometown. I was flabbergasted. I didn't know what to do. You cannot do. I saw later at the market, she was wearing my sister's coat. She gave a child that for a simple coat. Didn't take too long. We were survived, surrounded by the Germans, and we were put in a cattle cars and sent to a different camp together with the people picked up in Drohobich, and we went to Plashov. And Plashov, Moment, please. Right here. Plashov, this is Krakow, and this is Vilichka. We went to Plashov. I knew some of you might be familiar with the town of Plashov, as where Schindler's List took up some prisoner to go to work in his camp. And he saves quite a few people by opening the camp for them with the agreement of the camp commander from Plashov. Didn't take too long. It was around August, September. They needed some more men for that camp, so they opened a Vielichka, which had salt mine, salt was extracted. They built holes and they built a factory to manufacture airplane parts and ammunition. The ship was going 24 hours a day, day in and day out. As the front was getting closer, we were sent back to Plashov and we were loaded in a train and going to cross the border to Austria. However, while we were working there, a dysentery broke out as the worst sickness a human being could have, if you haven't got any medication to curtail this. The only thing you could get is from the old country they felt if you take bread and you make toast and you burn it like coal, this might stop. But this didn't help. When we walked to work, there were some people marching and they wrote maybe 150, 200. Some people had to go to relieve themselves. Anybody who was relieved went outside. He was bitten by a four-legged dog or beaten by a two-way dog. People die like flies. One of my friends, he came from the same town. He had the diarrhea. And the only place we had hate was in the latrine. So the bags were not heated, were cold, was not oven to warm up, and he made that toast. Well, the man in charge of that bags walked in, took the bread away, and gave it to a fellow prisoner. The fellow prisoner knew him, had a little heart. He knew he's probably as hungry as I am. He gave the bread to me, he said, give it back to Joe. I took the bread, and I walked in the center of the barrack, calling his name, but there was no answer. As I walked closer to the center, I seen the statue in the left-hand corner of the barracks. I wanted to holler at him, why don't you answer when somebody calls you? Something held me back. As I got closer, I saw his belt and how his neck, he tried to commit suicide. So happened there was a doctor there. He examined him, and he said, he's breathing. He's alive. Let him lay a little bit. He will be OK. By the way, I saw him later on in Chicago. He survived. Coming back to work, going to work, and one day I'm coming back, and there's a Gestapo man, man in charge of our barracks, taps me on his shoulder and asks me, who are you? He knows I'm a prisoner. He's away from. 
from Poland. Who are you? I said, I'm a Polish Jew. He says, where were you born? I said, in Poland. Then you're Polish. He said, no, I'm a Polish Jew. This was going on for about five minutes. Finally, I took, had enough guts. What can I lose? I said, can I ask you a question? He jumps up. How dare you to ask a German officer a question? However, he granted me that request. I said, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't steal. I went to work. Why am I here? First victory, defeating a German. He walked away. He had no answer for me. I felt good. I went back to work. The thing was going on. Sickness always went on. The day I didn't run away. He was sick. There were six back. Another thing, he worked in a mountain, sent mountains. He built factories, caves. They were reinforced with concrete and steel. And a lot of concrete came in and cement bags approximately 80 kilos in one bag. The bags were thrown out, and the concrete was used to build walls. There was sand was taken out by conveyor belts. The lights were primitive. Sometimes were none, sometimes were not. And one time, the lights broke. And there was no light. So there was a group that worked detail approximately 20 or 25 people. Sat down, what can you do? You cannot put the sand down because it's not going any place. And the couple walks in and sees her sitting and reports to the head couple pictured they were all sitting, didn't do any work. However, he did not say that we didn't have any electricity, they couldn't do any work. Each of us got 15 lashes an hour back. Total amount to the state, 75. They worked, continued working. Then we time to go home, back to the barracks. The tally has taken and three prisoners are missing. You cannot leave without having total amount that came in to work. They're looking all over. They say to escape was impossible. However, the head couple reminded himself there was a caveman in a third cave corridor. He spoke to the German to, who was the supervisor, so to speak. Did you check when the caveman whether any people were buried? No. I didn't see anybody. So he takes the shovel, goes there. Sure enough, he finds those three dead bodies. We were able to leave back to the barracks. We found out those paper sacks from cement could be very useful. We had just striped uniforms I know you're familiar with. If you put them around your body, it serves like an insulation, stops the wind a little bit, and you're not cold, and you put it around your body. However, the camp commander finds out and gives the order, anybody found with a paper around his back be severely punished. In addition to ones who worked with him and did not report him. So it happened, there was one guy in the afternoon shift around 12 o'clock, Walks to the bags, he's checked. It was very easy to check, but he has the paper around his neck. He touches back, paper makes noise. He was walked through eight blocks. Each block that he walked in, he got a beating by fellow prisoner. You'd be surprised how the prisoner act under those conditions. They don't take him as a fellow prisoner. They take a committed crime, we will be punished. That's the only way how they by the time he went to the sick call or to the hospital, he was dead. The work was going on as usual. People were dying. Crematorium was built. They couldn't keep up with the people who died to burn them. Came, war came closer, and we were sent on a train to Linz was already 
end of August, beginning of September, the heat was awful. The people, there were 100 to 120 people per cattle car. People were crying for water. Picture with so many people in a cattle car, heat burning down, and you have no water. We stopped in Linz to be disembarked, and there's a very much convoy either going to the front or coming from the front, listen our cries. He goes over to the man, to the Gestapo man who's in charge of alcohol. Why don't you give the people some water? He looks him up. Would you like to join him? Well, that Wehrmacht officer knew who is he dealing with. He had to back off. We were disembarked. We worked for two and a half days to a camp, Mauthausen. Mauthausen was like a Home Depot. If you want something to do some work in, a, in your house, you go to Home Depot, buy the necessary supplies. The camps were there surrounding us. If they wanted more people, all what they did is call up Mauthausen, and there were many people were sent there. And usually the stay in Mauthausen is very brief, two, two and a half weeks, until you go further. In Mauthausen, prior to me coming, or some other people like myself, there were steps built by fellow prisoners who were there before. Count 154 steps. At the bottom of the steps, there was a quarry. You went to the quarry, put a boulder on your shoulder, and you walked 154 steps to the top just to throw it away down. Either you went down to pick up another one, or you went to get a withered boulder to the quarry. Going home as long as the total was the same as you walked down, dead or alive, came back. This was going on for two or three weeks. Then you were shipped to another camp. After we went to another camp, I went to a place called Milk. Milk was a camp just like the ones we worked before, to Sand Mountain. You worked there every morning. You went by train, and at night you came back. In Mauthausen, you did some day work, and then you were sent to another adjacent camp. Going to adjacent camp, we went to a camp called Ebensee, also in Austria. The camp was built for approximately to hold 8,000 people. This was already 1945. The camp swelled to about 20,000 people. There were three crematoriums there. The crematoriums couldn't keep up with burning the bodies. We, every morning, there were 2,000 walking under the camp to do some work. After we were liberated and we talked to people, they asked you, who are you? So people were prisoners. So they looked straight in the face. They didn't know anything about it. The camp closed was a town called Puchheim. Puchheim was the town, and there's a guy who had a movie, and he was bombed. So he asked the camp commander from Ebensee to send him some men to build it up. And everybody was fighting for the job because the guy was nice enough pulled some potatoes and gave it to us, so we had additional ration. This was gone for a few days, and then came May. People were there, you got up at night, you didn't know where you were walking, either on the ground or you're walking over a body. The food was not to have. Picture if a camp was built for eight, and all of a sudden you got the additional 12,000 people coming to you, they have no food for them. You ate human flesh. Rats wasn't safe. Finally, on the 6th of May, 1945, there's a appeal called, everybody has to go to the center of the camp, and the camp commander speaks, now we won't try to save you. Right here, there 
caves reinforced by big stones, and you'll be, you will save there from the plain. And he called all interpreters to come forward. Well, they came because there was international. There were all kind of nationalities, German, Polish, gypsies, Romania, you name it, everybody was there. Only one Frenchman had the nap guts to say point blank, hell no, we won't go. I'd rather be killed by a bomb than by a bullet. If you stay put at 10 o'clock, everybody left, the guards and the army came in, a jeep came in, and we went to the center of the barracks, and we took our law in our own hands. We slit the throats of the couples. The American soldiers tried to interfere, let the law take care of it. He had the answer for them. Where was the law when they did the same thing to us? Nowhere, he had to leave. They came in, and first thing the Red Cross arrived and appealed to us, please, don't go to town and eat yourself to death. Don't drink any milk. Don't eat any meat. We will give, put you on a diet and try to bring you back to health. But when you're hungry, who cares? You have to eat. We were there a few days, and then came Sunday, and a friend of mine, he said, let's go to town and see how the other people live. So we went to town, and a German couple invited us for dinner, Sunday dinner. We looked at each other, shall we? Can we trust him? <laughs> but food got a better off it. We went to eat. We talk about, about tell the story, and they always tell you they didn't know anything about it. Finally, after dinner, we walk home, and on our way to the barracks, there was a kitchen, American kitchen, and we saw soldiers. So we went over to them, can we get a job? So said, gee, guys, we have no money to pay you. Besides, we haven't got any job for you guys, unless you want to work as a KP. I took the job, the other guy went to camp, and I asked him to send me another guy. So sure enough, I stayed there. And he sent me another guy, and I saved with the soldiers. I got clean clothes, I got a shower, I slept in a bed, and I ate once a day from morning till night. <laughs> but I had food, so we stayed there until 1946. In 1946, I'm called as a witness to Dachau. There was the camp commander who was caught and has to stay at trial, and they needed witness. So I was there, and he got a sentence of seven years. I didn't know what else had happened with him, but this was his trial that he had. Going back, I start, there was this place, camps open for the people who came from different countries that didn't want to go back home. They stayed there. And they were satisfied. Going there, I tried to look around. But after six months, I got a job for UNRWA. And they were getting paid. You didn't get paid money, but you got rations. Flour, sugar, candy, cigarettes. I was alone. I didn't want to live in camp anymore. I found a job among the Germans. I got a room. And I got the dressing, and I didn't need the sugar, so I sold it. I went to the restaurant to eat, and I was happy. While we were in Ohm, there was a staff sergeant, and we became friends, and there was a river. Two rivers joined, and we were swimming in one of them. So he said, gee, you're going to swim in a river which is filthy. 
say, no, we use the other river, the single one. Yeah, but the two rivers join. And as we stand in, there was a mill. The boards gave the old farm down seven feet down. He falls on a concrete floor, breaks his ankle, mm. and is being shipped, to, being shipped back to the States. The other guy gets a hold of the U ladder, just gets scraped, and in the center of the whole room was a manhole filled with water. I fell in the water, nothing happened to me. However, before he goes home, he asked me, here's my address. Once you settle, write to me, and I will try to send you an affidavit, affidavit to bring it to the States. So I took address, I said, you're probably just talking about it. However, I did write, and sure enough, he did send me affidavit, and he sponsored me. I came on Thursday and went to work on Monday as a shipping clerk. And while waiting there, I went up to the top of the ship, and I saw the Statue of Liberty. It was a beautiful day. The school kids was marching, army was marching, bands were playing, and we had a conversation with each other, and he said, gee, American people are very nice. They came to greet us. <laughs> I was very happy. And two weeks later, I was very surprised. The reason the parade was there was St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good while it lasted. And I worked, I finally, yeah, I went there the first three weeks. I ate in his house and he paid for a room. Finally, once I got paid, I went over to him and said, Carl, two things. Either I'm paying for the food or you find me a room and board. So give me another week. Sure enough, he found me a room and board. I worked there. I, paid, I got paid $30 a week. And the room and board was $22. But I was able to support myself. Then another couple of friends came from Germany. I picked them up in New York. I'm a big American. Welcome to refugees from Germany. <laughs> and they stayed with me a couple of days. Then I had to go on a journey to Illinois. They were assigned to go to Illinois. They got a job. They moved to Chicago, and they write me a letter. Please, come to Chicago here. Please, we'll be together. I took a dry run. I went to Chicago. I picked up the paper. Sure enough, I was able to find a job for Mills Industry, making ice cream machine, ice cream machine, uh, some other machines, slot machines. And they were paying me $54. It's a $20 raise. So I took the job, we lived together, we got an apartment, we share everything. And all of a sudden, I get the letter from Uncle Sam. <laughs> finally, I said, Chief, finally they found me, they want to welcome me. <laughs> As I opened up, this is a draft letter. I have to support to the Army. Not being the citizen, you think Army works certain ways. I didn't have a report in Illinois. I had to drive to New York. I was four digs. They, they sent me to uh, Massachusetts to Camp Edwards, where I got basic training. And around March, I'm shipped overseas, where? To Germany, <laughs> where I came from. But I tell you something, there were GIs with me. And we got three meals a day, quiet, five o'clock, we were ready. Some people took advantage of the army offering something. And I was, I guess, smart enough. I took it, they offered me to go to school, get high school diploma, which I didn't have. I finished only seven grades. Learn a trade as a welder and lathe operator. And I was able to find a job. But I picked up, by being in Germany, picked up my Romance, my girlfriend, who lived not far before I left to the States, and we resumed our courtship. So after a little while, she was agreed to it, to leave the parents there and come to the States, which she did. But it was very nice. The army has, she came from Czechoslovakia. And this was considered Iron Curtain. Before they clear you up to get the visa, 
she had to be investigated. It took nine months by the time she, I got permission to marry. The only thing was happiness, usually I was ready with my orders cut to go by ship. I was transferred and went by plane to the States. I was able to find Fort Hamilton. My wife had a sister living in New York, which we didn't tell her they were coming. And that evening I went from camp, took a cab and went to Brooklyn where she lived. And the cab driver looked and said, are you sure you want to get off here? I said, hold on and let me see the names at the mailbox, see what I want to get off here. Sure enough, she's still there. I got off there. I picked up the paper. I found another apartment in New York, Washington Township, and I got a job and was very happy. And then I was going to the Army, being discharged, and going back to the States. In 67, I'm getting subpoena. I have to go to Bremen to testify against the same man who got only seven years. So the court gives you the privilege of picking any language that you want to testify, the interpreter will be there. I chose English. So the lay I spoke my piece, and there were two lawyers defending those camp commanders, and the lady, there were three judges, and I had my saying, and she says, what I supposed to have said, I was amazed. That's not what I said. And the lawyers agree with me. It's not what he said. The judge jumps up, hollers. He's a man who understands perfect German, speaks, and yet he chooses to speak English. You run a freedom of speech. I really don't know what has happened after I'm done. That's done. But I understand that he got life sentence because there's no death sentence in Germany. I went on my way and I got married. I got two daughters, lived in Jersey. And in Jersey had a law that any adult going through life acquires enough knowledge equivalent to a junior in college. However, she has to have high school. And my wife living in Czechoslovakia was thrown out with all A's because she is Jewish. She didn't have to tell her. But they gave her a test. She passed with flying colors. They gave her 62 credits. She went to work as an accountant, study accounting. And so happened that my daughter and my wife were a junior and senior in college. My daughter was going to Tennessee, McLeas, and my wife was going to McLeas State College in Jersey. It so happened they had the identical test one day, and my daughter called up and said, Mom, how did you make out? She, daughter, dear, I'm paying for you education. How did you make? Oh, I passed. I had 73. Boy, that's nice. How did you make out? 92. That's disgusting. <laughs> But she passed, and the, sec the last year of her school, she become ill. She gets cancer. However, she makes a test, and then she gets, goes for CPA and gets one of the five highest scores in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> she worked only two years as a CPA. And one of the bosses who took the test five times didn't pass. <laughs> he gave her such a hard time that she had to quit. But then she died. She, my daughter got married. So it happened he was glad that she was able to see her daughter married. And then she died a year later. And we lived in New Jersey. My daughter got married. My other daughter was still in school. <clears throat> she went to VCU, 
And when she had to take the master, she came back to New Jersey. She went to Fordham University to finish her master's as a social worker. And she still lives in New Jersey. My other daughter lives in Florida. She has two kids, a boy and a girl, and did that. And finally, I was going to work, after I retired, I was going to work to New York, taking a bus three times a week, 40 hours only. And it was rather keeping busy. <coughs> and one day, I'm going home on a bus, and I see a lady in a bus getting up, looking like she was lost. So finally, I talked to her, I speak English. So I asked to speak Polish, a little bit German, no. Not speaking finally with her voice. Polish, she understands a little bit, and I understand Russian a little bit. We were able to converse. I asked her where she's going. She told me she lived three stops ahead of my stop. So I said, I will get up, and I will go over to the bus driver and tell you where to let you off, and sure everything will be OK. <coughs> and at the same token, I asked her, Give me your telephone number, so when you get there, so I know you got there safe. Nothing else. <laughs> Actually, there was something else. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> she told me that her name is Adele. If you remember correctly, the lady that picked up the child my daughter's daughter, they gave her the name Adele Bramska. Adele is typical Polish name, and Bramska is since she was found under Brahma, which is a gate, that's how they gave it the name. So I thought, maybe. But then I looked at her, I said, no, she's much older than she would have been. However, I kept up and I found out, I called her up and wanted to speak to her. And the man answered, oh, there's nobody by that name. She gave me the name Adela. There's nobody by that name. So I was a little bit more annoyed. Sunday I met some other people who belong to the same synagogue. I talked about it. She said, we know her. I will talk. How the hell you will get together? Sure enough, she arranged a meeting on a Sunday, invited us for coffee, and I met the lady. And she said she's a prisoner in her own home. She cannot go to mail a letter. She cannot go to get a book. She cannot get any lessons. So first thing I made, I show where the library set, which was approximately a block and a half. Then I assigned it to the library to get learn English, which she took advantage of it. Then I put it to the synagogue to learn additional English. She was able to walk there. Then I went to Hackensack. She signed for high school. She was able to go there. However, the transportation was very nil almost. Either if her husband was nice enough to drive her there, then around 10 days she would call me to pick her up. Her buses was running very little at that particular time. This was going for quite a while. And then I asked her, let's have dinner sometime. So she said, I have to ask my boss. So sure enough, she asked him, and he gave me permission to go out with me for dinner. And we went to dinner. And while there, I asked the waitress for the check, he gives me the check. She takes out a piece of paper and gives it to me. And the paper says, how much is my meal? So I started laughing. She said, the lady who I work with told me that here, the lady pays for the own meal. So I gave her my check, too. <laughs> anyway, we partnered, then we kept company. And then I tell him, it's crazy. You didn't have to work there. There's plenty of jobs like you have to be taking care of the children. You can find a job like this. She listened to me. And she got another job and another lady who had four kids. But she was able to live there and worked only from six till about five. Whereabouts in their first job, she worked from about 6 o'clock in the morning until about 10 o'clock at night with two kids. So she was liberated. And we were keeping steady every time she went 
come home. She, after six class, she dropped in. We had a meal together. We talked. Sometimes I helped her with her English, but we were getting along. And then when my wife passed away, we were getting so she says, I was lonely. And she wasn't too comfortable. I asked her to marry him. We married. And we wanted to move. So we went to and a train, we had to develop some stuff to my daughter living in Florida. So on our way to Florida, of 90, we made a little detour. We wound up in Greensboro, and we looked around, and we liked both of them. Florida was not too attractive you know, because it was very hot. And we left it long, long thinking about maybe we will move. But I have to tell something, in 19, 2005, until two, th excuse me, until 2005, I was silent. I kept silent. I didn't want to talk about it. In 2005, the rabbi asked me to come to see him in his office, and he tells me, have you ever heard of about March of the Living? I said, no. So he tells me what it is, and he says, would you like, we need somebody, a Holocaust survivor, who is willing to come to us on a trip, one week in Poland, and one week in Israel. I said, I cannot tell you. It's too much to think about it, and too much pain. And the girls advised me, do not go. You're suffering enough. You don't want to suffer more. And the more I think about it, I came to a conclusion that somebody has to tell them what has happened. Don't speak about yourself. Speak to those who cannot talk about it. So the first trip I took was 2006. And on the way back from the airport, the rabbi tells us of the schedule and tell me, we go and go to Plasho, but it's raining, and then he says, well, we won't go to Plasho. So I was a little annoyed, so I go over to Rabbi, Rabbi, how come we're not going to Plasho? I say, Hank, what's there? There's nothing, there's a little hill and a monument. So I look at him and I say, Rabbi, hold on a minute. That little hill, if it could talk, there were a lot of blood clots there. If it would flow to Vistula River, it would overflow. Furthermore, one Sunday we had an appeal early in the morning. On a Sunday, we stood before a doctor, and you were either you point to the left or you went to the right. Out of 20,000 people, one third of the people got killed, taken away. We didn't know where. You walk in the days, so you don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, the music starts to play. Everything will pass by. Everything will be forgotten. But one thing is certain. Come May, the flowers will grow again. We dispersed. We went to the barracks. And nothing was said about it. And life was going on. For then on, every time we go on the trip, and this is going to be this April, it's going to be the tenth time I will be going again. In 2007, the rabbi gave me the opportunity to light one of the six candles in Birkenau. Birkenau was located approximately one and a half kil kilometers to two from Auschwitz. You could walk from Auschwitz to Birkenau. Birkenau burned 800 people a day. We walked there. So every time we went to Plasha, we made it, then we go continue talking. Keep going. And I was going, saying seven times when he lit, when I lit that candle, I thanked him. My name was scared in Europe and in Israel. Coming home in May, in 2007, my daughter told me, Dad, you better sit down. I got an email 
from a man named Alec Brot. Ask all kind of questions. Whether your father had a brother named so and so, a sister named so and so, his father named so and so, everything was correct. I believe 90%. I gave him a call, I came back in May, and I said, I want to come coming. He says, My grandma is still here. He died in 1986. So sure enough, I went back to Israel. I met him. And I found out that he was in a hospital. He was drafted in 1941, when the, before the war broke out, into the army. And he was stationed in St. Petersburg in Russia. He was wounded in uh, November of 1941 spend the time in a hospital, and they want to amputate his arm and his leg. And there was a doctor there who said, no, we won't amputate. Let him have his limbs, but let him be alive. So sure enough, they left it, and he be alive, and he gave, he had college. He asserted all schools that the Russian soldiers brought from Europe. So he had a very good job. However, he didn't believe the Russian, what Stalin was preaching, he was thrown out of the hospital. They was trying to have the hospital and he was going back home to see what's there. Then when I went, I met his wife and I asked him, how come he wasn't looking for me? He says he was. But the neighbors told him that everybody would die and I joined a partisan and I was killed, which wasn't true. So he went back to Russia. He met their lady and got married. So I asked him, my wife, who is flying in Russian, wrote to the army archives in St. Petersburg, asking for men. Same guy brought. The answer went, nobody by that name. So I asked his wife, how come the archives didn't have his name on it. Simple. They changed his name to Seymour. So her first name was not there. And he died in 1986. In 1986, and went again, I went back there at 2 or 8. Instead of going to Israel, I went to Minsk. I found the grave. I cleaned up the grave. Everything was there. And I was able to say a prayer for him. It took my, my belief that at least I did not see him. At least I was able to say a prayer. Going back to Greensboro, we had a cantor who built a play, Judgment at Nuremberg. I'm sure some of the people see it in a movie or in a show. So he asked me, would you like to play, take part of it? Sure, why not? So he gave him the role as a judge, a German judge. <laughs> and I'm being trialed by the American court, and the chief justice of Germany addresses us. I'm the small, so he addresses me. You, who own the quarries in Mathouse, making tons and tons of money, and you tell me you didn't know anything about it? So I didn't know I was a judge. Now I tried to collect money for it. <laughs> this was in. And finally, came to the end. I got married. We live in High Point. And I have, in the middle, my daughter lives in in Florida, and one lives in New Jersey. And since then, I made a pledge in Birkenau. Anybody will ask me to talk about the Holocaust, I will be more than glad to answer, no matter how much it hurts. And <laughs> Uh, 
I may finish something with a poem that somebody wrote. Dedication of the stone in memory of our six million brothers and sisters who perished in the Holocaust. They have gathered to remember the reverence and love the six million of our brothers and sisters who perished at the hand of Hitler. They lie in the rest nameless graves. The resting places is far off, abundant, and fields and are lost to the eyes of the loving families. Despite this, they must not be forgotten. We shall remember them in the pain and in the agony. We shall remember them, and they would remember our brothers and sisters, for we have lived with them in Europe. We would have died with them in Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Bergen and Belsen, and Babia, and Helma and Treblinka. Every year, we go to Majdanek. Majdanek was a place where they had a big walking place. You walk the plank. And there was a machine gun set up. If a guy was shot, he was lucky. Otherwise, we fell dead, dead into the grave. And we visit this every year we go there. And as long as I live, I will never refuse if somebody seeks the story of Holocaust. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I saw something the other day um, that really caught my attention, that if we took one minute of silence for every victim of the Holocaust, we would be silent for almost 12 years. So um, Mr. Bro has been kind enough to have a short question and answer if anybody has something to ask him. I spoke to sixth graders in Winston Salem. There's somebody who has a question. There's somebody who has a question. And I asked a little girl asked me, writes me a letter. Usually we get letters. I answer one letter to the principal because I got 20 or 30 letters. And one girl writes to me and says, Dear Mr. Brooke, a sixth grader, I'm really pissed off. The doctor didn't allow me to come because I was sick. Her letter I answered personally, and I promise if you go in the vicinity and I'm there, providing you have permission from the teacher and your parents, I'll be able to pick you up and I'll let you listen to me. <laughs> Another guy asked me, would you ever forgive them? Forgive them, that's a big question. He deserves an answer. As a forgive, I don't know, but I tell you one thing, I will never forget. He took this as an answer. This was good enough for him. A man comes over to me, I so red, and he says, I got a confession. He said, I'm not a priest, but speak your peace. He says, my grandfather was a guard in the camps that you have mentioned. What answer can somebody give? Anybody? <laughs> when we go to Warsaw, there's a huge cemetery one of the largest cemeteries in Poland. And there's a grave, after they clean up some of the graves, there's a big statue of a man, Janusz Korczak. 
I don't know whether anybody heard of the name Janusz Korczak. And he's subpoenaed to Gestapo, and they all make him an offer. You bring the kids here, and you can go free. If they'll give you a coat, you can take off your star of David, you'll be free. And he thinks about it, say, how can I do this? Let him go to die and I'm be free? I cannot do it. So he holds a little girl in his arms, tried to sing a lullaby to put her to sleep. And she says, one more question. I'm sure your parents witness it when you try to put the child to bed. She always has one more question. <laughs> well, he grants her that request. And she says, you says tomorrow we go on a big journey. And she starts out with a song, which I will translate into English. And she says, we are in Zoli game. We can't for me. We are in Zoli game. Sis fast lost in ye the tear. Sigh of links, sigh of rest. Or as we are in the land, as we are in Zoli game. I spent me a blind stain, has given Tell me where shall I go? And there is no place I can see where to go, where to go to that precious promised land, to the left, to the right. It's the same in every land. And there is nowhere to go. And it's me who should know. Won't you please understand? Now I know where to go. Where my folks proudly stand. Where to go, where to go. To the precious promised land. No more left. No more right, lift your hand and see the light, for at last I am free. No more wandering for me. Thank you. <laughs>